Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, next session of the MI212 class. <clears throat> uh, my name is Bill Knabel. I'll be your instructor for today. Uh, what we're going to be covering today is disease progression modeling. And it's going to run pretty much the same format as you have in the past. Uh, feel free to type questions as I go along, and I'll stop at uh, a few places along the way and try to answer any questions. And if there's anything that uh, can't be answered today, I'll go ahead and uh, post that up there in the, in the next couple of days. And before we get started, just let you know the data set for the problem will be also be posted at the end of this lecture today. So you'll have that data set as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, today we're going to, like I said, talk about disease progression modeling. And everybody pretty much has seen or likely has seen this first equation that's up here where clinical pharmacology is really defined as disease progression plus drug action. And in previous lectures, you've talked about drug action and modeling drug action and, and how it may affect um, the disease in play. So what we're going to talk about today is how you might go about modeling the disease portion of that. And when we think about disease progression modeling, what we should think about is that the normal state is kind of a homeostatic balance. So in the case of diabetes, you might have glucose control. You might have a nice balance between glucose utilization and, and glucose production. Or in the case of um, neurotransmitters, say, you might have a nice balance between acetylcholine and dopamine. However, when you have a disease state that perturbates that normal system, uh, you may start to have an imbalance. So in the case of Parkinson's, you'll have an imbalance of acetylcholine and dopaminergic neurons. Um, in the case of glucose, you're going to have, uh, I'm sorry, in case of diabetes, you'll have some perturbation of the, of the glucose utilization system. So what we want to do with disease progression modeling is model that underlying mechanism that's perturbing that normal system with the idea, hopefully, um, that not only will you describe the disease progression well, but hopefully the, the, the medicine or the medication you end up using will helpfully return, or at least to some degree, return those people to the normal homeostatic state. So what we're going to talk about today then is disease progression. Um, some of the markers that we talk about when we use about the disease progression, um, these can be things as simple as biomarkers, things like um, results from, say, uh, cerebral blood flow in a, in a SPECT analysis. Um, or they could be something like surrogate endpoints, maybe blood pressure when we're talking about a, a blood pressure modeling, a blood pressure medicine medication. Or it could be something like LDLC when we're talking about a, a statin. These can be measured on, continuous, on a continuous scale. Oftentimes, they're measured on a categorical scale. And we'll talk a little bit today later on about uh, one thing you can do or to try to uh, address the idea that they're measured on a categorical scale. Um, they could also, as, as I said, they could be imaging techniques. So when we build these pro disease progression models, um, what, why do we build them? Or what's really going to be the impact of these? Or what do we want to do with them? Well, I mean, the main goal really is to, to assess the impact of whatever the therapeutic agent is that we're testing on the disease. And ideally, if, if possible, and the data allow, we can decide whether it's a, uh, this is probably the last time you're going to hear this symptomatic effect versus disease modifying. We'll, we'll start to refer to this as an intercept effect versus a slope effect. So we'll, we'll see whether the disease affects some offset of the disease underlying natural history or if it actually affects the slope in some way or the relationship with time in some way. Um, other, ration, other things that you might use disease progression models for um, are to improve your drug development through simulations. Early on, you might use it for trial design, so looking at duration, looking at sample sizes, looking at expected response. Um, later on, you might use it for kind of a, looking at across the entire therapeutic area portfolio. So you might, you might in, bring in drugs that have similar modes of action but different mechanisms to, to affect the same endpoint to try and get a better definition of what's going on across your entire portfolio. Um, you can use it to better understand and treat disease. By that, I mean you, you want to target items that diminish the rate of disease progression and ideally, if at all possible, uh, will, present the, will prevent the disease. 
that's kind of like, the, I mean, you can envision that as being the holy grail of kind of treatment that you can prevent the disease. So you can model some way or develop some model that allow you to target your therapeutic to something that will do that. Okay, so now we kind of know, what, you know why we might do it. Um, where would we apply these disease progression models? Well, very simple. You, you'd apply them in either PK or PD analysis or um, dose response data analysis. With the idea being that you'll make a better decision for a given therapeutic by being able to tease out the effects that are due to the drug, to possibly to the placebo, as well as the natural disease progression of what's occurring. Uh, you could use it for individualization of therapy. And the key here really for these, the application of these is where these are applied really is across the entire development spectrum. So early on um, for something, is, something like drug candidate selection, where you may have developed a disease progression model with, where you may have developed a disease progression model with one candidate and then applied it across some of the other ones. Uh, you can use it for clinical trial simulations. I guess, again, like I said, individualization of therapy. Um, in the long run, you may very well use it for pharmacoeconomic um, impact. So actually in later phase development where you want to assess your therapeutic versus other therapeutics that are already on the market. Um, and that, that kind of ties right into that phase four simulation um, to help you either build treatment algorithms or for making marketing claims. So really, again, the thing here is you can use these disease progression models you develop across the entire range of development. And the other thing to think about here is, is, is how complex these are. You could think about probably they're going to move from something that's relatively simple um, early on in drug development to something that could be relatively complex. And, and we'll talk a little bit, Matt, I think, mentioned in his last lecture about the uh, calcium model that was developed. And I'll just bring that up as one example as we get closer to the end today. So. How do we develop these, or where do these disease progression models come from? Well, they come from studying the disease and obtaining the data, very, very simple and straightforward. But invariably, what you also have to do is talk to disease specialists. So talk to the clinicians and get some understanding of the disease. Um, you look at the picture or the time course of disease, so that response versus time. And you can imagine then that, that that picture will change depending upon how much data you have and where, where you're at in that clinical development paradigm. So early on, again, that picture may be fairly simplistic and as you, as you move on down and you get more information, that becomes fairly complex. Um, you wanna then translate these pictures into some kind of disease progression model. Um, today, we'll talk a lot about um, linear models or asymptotic models. There's other models that you, can, you could use as well. You wanna be able to explain the model parameters that you build um, I'm sorry, the, the parameters of the model that you build. Uh, you, again, this is kind of a, a looping process where you, you do some work, you develop a disease model, you, again, get back with the clinicians and talk about other factors that you may or may not have measured that are going to influence those parameters. And then you want to translate possibly that, that model into sets of parameters or sets of values that are, that are going to affect that underlying disease progression model. Things to keep in mind here are how you might borrow data. So in all of this process, um, what you may end up having to do is either borrow data between studies, uh, whether it be for placebo effects or natural disease history. Um, how you borrow that data can be important. You, you, you need to give some thought to, you know, are you gonna bring, are you gonna fix some component of the model? Do you wanna use um, Bayesian priors for some component of the model? Um, Okay, so after kind of getting an idea of you know, why do we want to do this, where do they come from, let's jump a little, let's, we're getting a little ahead, but let's, let's talk a little bit about data setup for um, disease progression models with non-MEM. Um, oftentimes, or sometimes drug concentrations and disease measurements may not be part of the same data set. So for instance, the, the Exposure may be driving um, your your disease progression model or your or your, or your disease model uh, so, or, or time, and so you might have um, PK in one and say exposure in another. 
In that case, you might do sequential modeling where you have you know, PK and then you have a, a PK data set and you have a, a disease progression modeling data set. Um, you might fit the, fit the PK data to get something like AUC and CMAX and then use that in some way to drive some underlying portion of the um, disease progression model that you're developing, so the actual drug portion. Um, The disease progression models data sets likely to contain individuals that are not in the PK data set. So placebo treated or untreated individuals are just going to have to if you're going to get some idea of the underlying, underlying disease progression. One thing you want to keep in mind is that you want to maintain non-MEM IDs consistently for these patients um, across both the PK and the, and the DPM or the disease progression modeling data sets. And that's really just, a, it's, it's not like a hard and fast rule, but it it's, makes it simple then if you do some plots later on that you can you're comparing one to one so you know exactly what where that ID came from. Now if you're doing simultaneous modeling um, where you have both PK and, and disease progression modeling in the same data set, you're going to need some identifier flag and we'll talk about um, uh, an example data set to delineate both PK and disease measurements. Um, that disease progression por portion of the model or I should say that the effect portion of the model can be driven directly through concentration or indirectly through some effect compartment concentration. Um, if you do simultaneous modeling, it allows kind of for one-step Monte Carlo simulation scenarios. So when you want to go and, and do some simulations later on, it'll make it simpler. And you can also work in um, a sharing of variability across PK and the disease measurement. So as we move forward, what we're going to talk about in the next few slides and for the next, I don't know, say 45 minutes or so, are some background information on some simple disease progression models, um, some snippets of non-MEM code that can be used to describe the disease progression portion and the effect of, of drug, really, on the disease progression portion. And then some assumptions around um, the model that's, the, the data that's developed, or the model that's developed. Okay, so let's move on to the types of disease progression models. And again, if anybody has any questions, just please feel free to uh, chat them in the uh, question box. I'm going to make this, just bear with me a moment, I'm going to make this screen a little smaller so we can see it. So now what we're talking about here on this first screen, and we're going to see a lot of this, so I'll have to spend just a little bit of time in, in outlining what we see here. We basically have a, 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 a linear disease progression model. On the y-axis, we have status some disease progression measurement that's changing over time. In this case, it's decreasing over time, reflecting um, a person getting sicker, getting worse. And what we have here is a simple model that describes it. We have S0, which is basically the baseline, and we have um, alpha. And I think in some of your, your PDFs that I've posted, it had omega there. That should actually be an alpha. And if there's any places, actually, there's a few places that I tweak the presentation just slightly. I'll go ahead and post this, the new uh, PDF again at the end of this lecture today. But basically we're describing this with a simple slope intercept model where the slope parameter describes a change with time and all of these plots that we're going to look at here today, um, the assumption here is that we're just seeing the kind of typical or the, or the, the average individual or the typical typical curve here. We're not seeing any variability around it but obviously as everybody's aware there's there's variability both between and within subjects in this, but I thought for, for simplistic reasons, we want to just show um, what the typical looks like so we can actually see this. So just a snippet then of, of non-MEM code that we might use, say dollar sign pred code we might use to describe this is listed below, where we have the baseline, which is effective, uh, which is estimated by some theta parameter, theta one, plus some inter-individual variability. And then again, a slope, also uh, theta two then with some inter-individual variability. And then we have the prediction, which is a function of that intercept and slope times some time, which is the time in the data set, and a residual variability. In this case, it's proportional. This could very simply be additive or some other model. But fairly a straightforward model and um, what we'll build on now as we move through the next couple of slides. So now let's, let's talk a little bit about, and this is where we start to differ in some of the, the tech terminology that we like to use. Rather than talking about symptomatic and 
um, disease modifying. We're going to talk about um, intercept offset effects or slope effects, and I'll explain to you again in a few slides why we don't why we don't just mix those interchangeably. So in this in this particular slide now, what we have here is we have some drug effect that is uh, offsetting the disease progression baseline. And in this case, it's simply a, a offset on the intercept. So we have a drug that's, that's acting immediately upon given to shift up that um, disease progression timeline. And what you'll notice is that what we do is we shift it up, but we don't actually change the slope at all. All we're doing is shifting that entire line up. And so we're basically improving by offsetting the baseline. In this case, what we're, what we're going to assume is that that in the next couple of slides is that as you go down in the baseline, as your value goes down, you're, you're getting sicker. So again, this is simply going to be described by the equation that's listed here where we have some baseline effect and we have a, a drug effect. This is this, this CE comma A. And this could be, this could be drug, drug in the effect compartment, this could be drug in the this could be a drug in the central compartment, this can be in this case we're showing a UC um, times sum offset and then your typical alpha times T for the remaining slope slope parameter. So again if we want to look at um, what that looks like in res with respect to a, a PRED model down below, what we have here is we have a baseline, again we have a, a theta parameter along with some inter-individual variability for the baseline. We have our alpha parameter. Now we have a, a drug effect. In this case, we have a AUC that's um, driving that, that drug effect. And that is going to have some effect on that underlying disease progression model. And it's going to have that effect simply by changing the, uh, the baseline. So it's going to shift that baseline up, in this case, 10, 10 units. And then their change with respect to time will be the same as somebody who's untreated except their baseline, their, their, their overall um, value will be slightly higher. Now one thing that's not shown in this plot is what happens when you stop the drug effect. And when you stop the drug effect in this case, um, it's basically just going to come back down to zero. Not zero, I'm sorry. It's gonna, this red line is going to approach this, the original slope line and you're going to see them continue on down. So this, this effect is not going to continue um, continue beyond stopping of, of, of drug. And actually all of these slides are going to show um, so that basically there's the, they're not going to capture what's going to happen when you stop drug. So these slides are basically assuming that drug treatment continues. So let me get a quick question here that somebody asked already. Um, How to describe the increasing phase? Oh, I see. So actually, in this case, in this case, actually, we're we're not actually. This is an instantaneous effect. So actually, it's not a matter of. Um, there's no delay here in time. So you can imagine, you can envision in this case that 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 drug is given and the effect occurs instantaneously. So there's no time delay. Um, we'll see you later on in a few slides. You might model that. You could envision where this. Um, this red line might occur slower, that, that effect might be approached slower, so it might be some delay, and so in that case, maybe it's a, um, some effect compartment concentration that's driving that um, change in offset rather than um, something like an AUC that's in, that in this case, we're assuming it's instantaneous. Oh, and somebody wants to know, what is beta off doing? Beta off is just describing the relationship between um, the concentration, whatever that might be, whether it be AUC or um, effect compartment concentration, and the baseline. So it's just it's just going to be the relate to the, the basically the, the the theta that's describing that drug effect, and that's going to be additive to that baseline. Okay, so what, if we have a a offset effect, we could also have a slope effect. So in this case now, rather than having, rather than seeing that uh, instantaneous bump and, a, and a, a parallel slope to the natural history progression, which the black line is basically your natural disease history, now what we're seeing is a change in slope. So this would be, this would be in the old term, in the other terminology, this would be classified as, say, a, a modifying or disease modifying effect. Um, but what we're going to talk about here is slope effects. So in this case, what we have now is rather than um, that drug effect occurring 
on the baseline, that effect actually is going to come in on the slope. So again, down here in this parameter, this equation that we basically have here, we have our baseline um, plus, again, this concentration in the effect compartment, AUC, some exposure driver for, uh, for the drug effect, plus whatever the, the slope term, plus the, um, what describes the relationship between the drug effect and slope in this case. And in this case, again, this is just simply what's happening here is uh, once you give this, you have a, an instantaneous basically change in slope. So you have a slope then, this, this um, slope effect is, is smaller. So you have basically a slower rate of disease progression. And again, this can be described relatively simply um, in the case of a dollar sign pred model. And you know, I, I use dollar sign pred here as an example, but you can envision, and, and we'll, we'll show this in one of the next coming slides, you can envision this being a more complex model where you have a, a PK component. Um, the other part we're not putting in here actually, we're just assuming some, some linear drug effect. Uh, the other part of this piece that you're probably going to have is some placebo effect. So you will likely have some, um, as well as some natural disease history time course, you'll have some um, placebo effect also that's going to come into play in this model. And so in this case, like I said, the dollar sign pred in this case is simple. It's straightforward. The same S0 that we saw before uh, as an estimated parameter with some inter-individual variability. Um, a slope parameter, again, with some estimation and some individual variability. And now in this case, we're gonna have the same effect. We have another uh, a term that describes the relationship between um, the drug and the effect of the drug. And actually what, now though where it's coming different here is, is that rather than affecting the um, baseline, we actually have that effect is gonna be driving the slope. It's gonna be changing that alpha parameter. So in this case, it's gonna make that slope lower. So that slope's gonna get smaller, so that you see a, a change or, or, or less, of a, um, less of a disease progress over time. So a quick question. Um, In this particular model, the, the slope is being driven by the, ex by in this case, it's going to be AUC. So it's going to be exposure. So, I mean, you could be accounting for some, some delay in time here um, with using AUC rather than, say, some direct marker. So this might be an example where you've modeled the PK, you predicted the exposure, and then you might use um, area under the curve to drive um, the, the, the effect of drug. And it's the effect of the drug and its effect on the disease progression, the, the linear disease progression model. Okay, so just what's an example data set look like? Um, and let me make that just slightly bigger. For a disease progression model, again, um, the, I can't account and say that the DVs match up to what we saw in the previous, but basically a little snippet of what that might look like is where you have basically here, you have a, some group of individuals who have no treatment. So in this case, we're not, even, we're not even considering them placebo, we're just considering them untreated. And we have another group of individuals that that have treatment, and in this case, it's, it's exposure, and exposure is what's gonna be driving this, this disease progression, uh, the, the drug effect, and then altering the disease progression model. Yeah, and that's a good question. So uh, another question was, yeah, you know, and, and, and for, for simplicity of, of showing this, somebody asked is, um, let me make this smaller again. Uh, would it be likely that there would be some inter-individual variability on exposure? And the answer to that would be yes. There'd be no reason why there couldn't be some, not on exposure, but on the parameter, on that theta three parameter. There's no reason why you couldn't have ATIS on, on there as well, inter-individual variability. I think it was just, a, just, a, just for simplicity points here, we didn't include it. But you probably, in fact, you probably would have um, some uh, random or inter-individual variability on that parameter as well. Okay, so if we can have models that affect the slope and the intercept, we can of course have models that affect both. So in this case, we would have a, a, a combined drug action model. So what we have now on, on, on here, we have the same disease progression model that, that changes over time. 
Now we're, we're showing a couple of different effects here. We have, um, like I said, the black line is the, is the natural history or what's occurring um, without any intervention. Um, the red line is basically the offset that would occur if, if your drug had an effect on the, on the intercept only. Um, the blue line, dashed line, represents um, the drug effect that would have on uh, if, your, if your therapeutic had an effect on slope only. And um, the green line represents a product that has an effect on both slope and intercept. So something that maybe has um, some immediate action as then, as then also, also changes that uh, relationship for, uh, that occurs over time. And the equation to express that um, in very general terms is listed here where you have um, your disease progression is equal to a baseline um, plus your offset effect which is then a function of, of exposure plus, your, plus an, a function of slope effect which is a function of exposure plus alpha. So we're changing both the intercept via this term and we're changing the slope alpha via this term and we're going to end up with a line something like the green line if, if we were to measure that over time. And just kind of an example possibility, can, possible control stream here that you might see in non-MEM. Again, you might see a, a simple um, theta identifying the baseline. You would have another term identifying that slope effect or that alpha terminology. Now you would actually have two effects. And I just gave an example here. It may or may not be, um, uh, it's just one, one possibility where you have um, AUC or some total exposure that's driving the change in slope. So this change in slope is driven by AUC and you have some Cmax or some immediate parameter that's, dr that's driving the offset. So given that they've reached a certain Cmax, they get a specific offset and if they have reached a certain AUC, they have a change in slope. And you could express that down here then in the, in the equation for the prediction simply um, baseline plus your, your uh, effect for the maximum concentration or that relationship there between theta 4 and Cmax and then your change in slope um, with that affecting time, I mean I'm sorry, multiply by time and then in turn some residual variability. Again, uh, you could envision that you could have intersubject variability on, on the theta terms for the drug effect. You probably would also have built into this model somewhere um, or, or at least consider, want to think about some placebo effect as well. So we want to think about you know, what happens to patients that are treated but not treated with the active compound but treated with placebo. So you probably need, if you really want to do a good job of defining what's going on here, you, you need some portion of your data set that's natural history or completely untreated, if, if at all possible. Um, some portion of your data set that's um, placebo treated or, or possibly um, say gold standard treated and then some piece of your data set that's treated with the, the therapeutic of interest plus maybe the gold standard or uh, maybe placebo plus your therapeutic of interest. So you can define well um, all of these components. Otherwise you're going to be, if you, if you don't have placebo in there, you're going to have a, you're going to have a, um, you might have a, a, or I should say if you don't have the natural history in there, you're going to have a hard time de de delineating um, the drug effects from placebo versus natural history. So we've talked today about, we've talked about um, protective, we talked about intercept and slope effects and, and in all of these cases, all of these examples that I've given so far, um, the slope and the intercept effect are, are well defined. So they're, they're very obvious. So in this case you have a, you know, you have a very obvious offset effect. Um, you have a very obvious slope effect and the offset effect occurs instantaneously. So you know, basically upon met giving the drug or shortly thereafter you have a, a change in that baseline parameter um, and then you also have a change in some slope term. And, and these two lines don't really, they don't, they don't overlap, there's no, there likely would not be some in, an issue with identifiability, at least not the way I've expressed it. But there could be cases um, where it might be difficult to delineate um, an intercept from an offset effect. An intercept offset effect, I should say, from an effect on the slope. Now this plot's a little different. Um, shows the same type of 
model that we previously had, we have a, a, a linear change in natural history. Uh, we have an offset effect now, and this guy speaks to one of the questions somebody might ask. You have an offset effect here that has some delay. So rather than occurring instantaneously, you see some delay in that offset. And the only reason that you know it, that it's a delay in the offset, is that after at some period of time, um, the, uh, the change in disease status with respect to time is similar in slope to the natural history. Plus, we have we also are showing here a, a, a slope effect. And what you can see here is that if you, depending upon where you cut off your data, if you only have data here that's somewhere around, say, 50 time units or, or so, depending upon what this unit of time is, you're going to have a hard time delineating um, whether this is a, a slope or a, an offset effect. So again, that, that, that kind of comes to the idea that, you know, it, if you're using the terms disease modifying and, and symptomatic, you might very easily say, well, this is disease modifying because it's changing the slope effect. And so um, we want to be careful and just we want to keep in the back of our mind that these two effects could very easily be very similar. And depending upon the data that you've collected, um, it might be difficult to identify the two. So in this case, what you'd need is data that goes out further. You'd need data that goes out longer to be able to delineate um, these two effects from one another. Okay, so I want to do this. Why don't if anybody has any questions, feel free to post them to the uh, post them to the question section there, and we'll move on. Okay, so now we've talked up to this point about some fairly um, simple linear disease effect models, um, disease progression models, I should say, that are described by simple linear relationships with time. Um, Oftentimes, that's the case. We often we also can have um, asymptomatic disease. Uh, I'm sorry, asymptotic disease progression models, um, where these are models that contain an inherent maximum or minimum that is approached. So you might see some, uh, rather than you know, it's just a linear decline that that continues ad infinitum, which is is rarely the case. You might see it approach some asymptote. So you might see, uh, in the case of um, ADES-COG score in Alzheimer's, you might see that the ADES-COG score approach 70 or the maximum. Um, or in the case of depression, you might see it approach, you know, um, the maximum of the HAMD score if you're measuring it. So these, these types of models allow you to account for that. Um, you have a, a, a zero asymptote model, which has, which is basically has an exponential that describes, um, you have a baseline value, and now you have a, a, an exponential term here that describes the time delay for disease progression. So basically, a shift in that curve. So rather than it being um, linear, it's going to approach some asymptote. Uh, you could also have what's termed a non-zero asymptote model. So now in this case, what you have is you, you have a, you add yet another uh, term to this model, uh, which is this S sub SS, subscript SS, which is the maximum limit of the disease progression measurement. So this is where you might have a, say, you're approaching some maximum value. Um, and you still have a time delay for disease progression, and you still have a baseline, but these allow for, these are not gonna be linear, these are gonna be asymptotic approaches. So, now let's take a look at what um, that curve may look like. Yeah, and I, I actually, uh, somebody just posted a, quite a, a note saying that the inability to distinguish these slope and intercept effects um, is bad news for a drug developer um, who's looking for a quick answer. And I, you know, I, I would think that that's true. I mean, I think that you have to be very careful, especially in, you know, we're doing studies that are um, a, a year or, or, you know, 18 months in duration for something that we're only taking a snippet of, of that drug treatment and that, that natural history. So we're only taking a very small portion of it in time. So imagine somebody who has um, diabetes, where you treat them and, and you look at the, uh, the change in uh, hemoglobin A1C over a, short, a relatively short period of time compared to their whole length of diabetes. Uh, yeah, you have to be very careful as to how you, how you um, distinguish that and how you label it and how you model it and, and be cognizant of the limitations of the data that you have. I think that's, that's probably um, the most important thing. Okay, so 
back to zero asymptote model. So now in this case, um, we have a slightly different plot now. What we have, we have a similar uh, relationship. In this case now, we have a, a disease progression model that's um, now rather than being linear, it's starting to approach some asymptote. And now the way we, the way these um, drug effects look and come into play is, sli is slightly different. Um, you can have an offset in, in a simple baseline effect, again, uh, where, where it's affecting that S0 term. Um, or you could have a, a, a parameter that's affecting the slope, so that's the dashed blue line. Or you could have one that's affecting both slope and intercept. And so here we have a, a, a simple uh, equation for that, where we have some effect that's driven by some exposure relationship that's going to affect the baseline. And then we also have then of some effect that's again driven by some exposure method that's going to affect that time to disease progression or that delay. So it's going to basically delay the amount of time. Yeah, and so actually in this case, um, th this you could think of this actually as um, as flipped around from the previous ones. This just happens to be the, the example. So previously we were looking at um, a disease progression that um, you could envision that in this case, what we're talking about in this is actually the disease, the, the, the improvement actually is dropping that status. So you can think of this as a, as a, as the, as disease, as disease progression that's slowly approaching some asymptote. And now actually you're going to hopefully improve it. So it, it just kind of flipped around from what we saw before with respect to the plots. So now we can use a, now we can talk a little bit about a slightly more complex um, control stream. Not that we couldn't have talked about it before, but 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 just as an example. So in this case now we have a, a, a another snippet of a control stream where we have a PK, which is described by a one compartment oral model, and that's going to be used as the driver to the effect. And then we have in our error block we have basically our 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 effect component for the drug that's a simple, it's an Emax model that's, that's directly related to drug effect where we have uh, some Emax parameter. Um, and I believe this is where I changed um, the, just the nomenclature, make it consistent for throughout the control stream. I believe your, your code says TD max there and I meant to say TE max. So we have some Emax plus some EC50 and they both in this case have intersubject variability on them um, that then causes some effect that's driven by the concentration. Now we have our disease progression model, which is our baseline parameter, which again has a, a, a typical value theta six plus some inter-individual variability, as well as a time delay parameter, which again will have some um, estimate typical value plus some inter-individual variability. And now we're gonna have a we're gonna have a flag in our data set that's gonna allow us to flip between predictions. So in this case, um, the data set flag might be one for uh, observations or concentrations and uh, two for um, disease progression measurements. So here we'll, we'll, we'll predict concentrations with a simple proportional model. And now we have our disease progression component here, which is our S0 um, plus our um, exponential component there with the, with the time delay. And now we have the drug effect is basically acting on that S0. It's changing that. It's going to change the, uh, the offset of that, of that disease progression. And then again, we have some, in this case, an additive error term that's going to play in there. Nothing unique about additive or proportional here. I just, just, just the choice of what I used here. So this is, again, a snippet of something you might use for uh, a, a control stream for a zero asymptote model with some offset effect. Now, you can imagine that in addition to having some offset effect, you could, or, or in place of some offset effect, you could also have some slope effect. Obviously, if, if we're developing um, some therapeutic, uh, we would hope, actually, that this is where our therapeutic would come into play. So it has some effect on the slope of the disease progression rather than just some offset. And again, for simplistic purposes and continuity, um, Uh, we're talking about here, again, a, a drug that's acting through a, a um, direct effect driven by concentration. And now what we're going to see is the uh, drug effect is actually going to be acting on the 
time, time delay for disease recovery rather than on the baseline. And we're going to show that up here um, in the, in the, where the time delay for, is. And then we have our same typical um, error block down here where we have um, concentration being predicted for flag equal to one and our disease progression parameter or disease progression um, prediction when um, flag is not equal to one. And we've, again, have some error error added to that for the disease measurement. So yeah, I got a couple of questions here. Let me take just a moment and answer some of those. Um, so somebody asked, how do we know what the natural disease progression is? Um, well, I mean, I think that you're, you're not going to know that from a, a, a data that's just with, just with drug treatment. So you're going you're to need, minimally, you're going to need to, help, to try and describe that the relationship that you have, you're going to need un, hopefully untreated individuals, whether it be you're likely not going to be able to capture them in the same study. Um, I, I can't think offhand of a therapeutic that you could get away with that really where you have untreated individuals. But what you rely upon is um, other data from natural history. So whether it be um, that's collected over time in some epidemiology study where you might follow or, or people who have diabetes or heart disease or um, cardiovascular issues might have been followed over time. And you can use that part to drive your disease progression model. And then um, assuming that you have drug Assuming that you have treatment data, you probably will have placebo data as well. And again, like I said, though, you'll get an, you'll get a chance when you look at the data set that I'll provide to develop a placebo effect model as well. And in fact, that would be in here. There'd likely be a, a component here in this um, control stream, um, assuming it's in your data set for a placebo component of placebo patients as well. So so you can delineate you know, drug effect from placebo effects from disease progression. So the short answer to that question, I guess the long answer I just gave, is you're not going to have enough data if you only have um, people that are treated with the drug and nothing else. So you're going to have to get it, whether it be from um, disease progression, whether it be from some natural history study that was done, pulling some data from the literature somewhere. Right, so actually I got another question here actually is, um, can, can we build disease progression models or will these necessarily allow patients to get um, worse over time? I'll have to think about that actually. Let me, let me get back to you on that particular question. I think um, you definitely could build, you could definitely build a type of disease progression model that would allow, allow you to have some kind of, of rebound effect. You would have to think about that and build that in into the actual disease progression. And, and that's probably a good point. And I should say, we've talked, I talked about that. I mentioned that a little bit, but what I, in all of these plots, one of the things that we're not showing, I will show it in the next plot, but one of the things we didn't show here is really that um, the, these changes in disease status and progression are what's, what's occurring over time, assuming drug treatments continued. So assuming that you don't stop uh, treatment in any way, so that uh, once you stop treatment, um, in the case of the offset, that's going to approach and, and come back to where you, where you previously were. In the case of the slope, what's going to happen is you're going to keep that, you're going to keep that distance, but you're going to decline at the same rate. So that, that's going to continue to approach a similar asymptote as the, as the untreated. Okay, so what about the, the last well, I shouldn't say the last, but one of the other models we'll talk about. Um, well, before I do that, let me just see. There's a few other questions here. Let me just. Um... Oh, oh, it's a good question. So um, what's the meaning of, of asymptote here? And so what I mean is that you, you basically, the, the, the scale, the, the scale is approaching some asymptote. So you, you can't, it's not, you're not going to get any worse. So I mean, basically you approach some, some minimal or some maximal value. So in, in this case, the scale might, it might be 
maximized or minimized at something. So maybe in the case of ADES COG, it approaches a value of 70, or in the case of HAMD, it approaches a value of 52, or other scales, maybe, you know, they, they, they can't go, to, you can't drive somebody down to zero, but you, but it basically, um, it approaches some maximum um, decrease, I should say, or, or maximum state of disease progression. So that's what we mean by um, asymptotes in this case. Okay, so now let's talk about this last, uh, or I should say the, the other, the zero, the non-zero asymptote model. In this case now, we've actually added yet another component. We talked, I mentioned what that is basically where you have a, you have a baseline value um, and now you have a, um, uh, a time delay effect or, or time to disease progression as well as then some maximum value in the scale. So some maximum that you can approach. So in this case, what you can see here is basically that this, the natural history is such that they're gonna be approaching some maximal value of say 40 or so. They're not gonna get any worse. So what we can see here is we can have effects on um, baseline. We can have effects on um, the, the disease, the uh, time to disease progression. So if we had an effect on um, time to disease progression or, or disease, that time delay, you, you'd see the, the parameter change in this ideal way, assuming, you know, no variability and, and, and everything's accurately measured. Or you could have a change in the, um, the asymptote that's reached or the slope that's that, that maximum value that's going to be reached. Or you can have a, you know, you, you could in theory, I assume, have a combination of all of these. And again, what's, what's, what's occurring here is that you have an offset then. You have a return, and this, this slide actually slows it, shows it where the others doesn't, though it's, though it's a bit drastic here for um, some of these you basically are gonna have a return to this um, natural history, not as drastic um, for this change in slope. You're not gonna approach it that quickly, but you're going to approach this, um, this zero asymptote, th this maximum value, even once you discontinue treatment for all of these, you're going to start approaching this. Um, okay, so, one thing we should keep in mind uh, when, when we're talking about these disease progression models, where the drug part comes into play really can be on any of the parameters that you've estimated. So we've, I think we've pretty much exhausted that here in these examples, but I mean, you could have, if it's an estimated parameter or some portion of your model that's describing disease progression, your drug can affect that. It can have, it can, act at any of those particular sites. So it could act at the slope, it could act at the baseline value, it can act at the time delay. So just, just to keep that in mind as, you, as you're thinking about where, these, where you're gonna build these. Um, and then, you know, the, the model that you build and how the data look and, and what you end up building really depends upon on, on how quickly the drug acts, um, the length of the effect, the time to offset, and we kind of really haven't described a whole lot there. I mean, this uh, really about how you might describe the time to offset as well. Um, so some other disease progression models. I, again, I'm not going to I'm not going to share uh, code necessarily, but the, you can envision that you could have really any any kind of model that you might describe. Um, PD data with or pharmacodynamic models you could use to describe disease progression. You could use a simple Emacs function that might give you a, 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 a look similar to those asymptote models. You could use an inverse Bateman function and this would, this would allow you to actually have a kind of a cyclic response where you might see a, an offset or some drug effect and then that returns to, um, returns to a previous value. Um, you can also use the, the, the whole larger set of indirect response models um, to drive disease progression models. You could also use um, models uh, like Matt had talked about, some of the transit compartment models where we talk about um, maturation of, of red blood cells. You could use something like that to describe disease progression. Um, it's really just a matter of, of, of envisioning what the data looks like I, you know, via graphical, via other methodologies, and then building a, a model that's going to account for it. Now, one of the things that I alluded to a little bit is dealing with capped scales. So these are, you know, 
the, the previous plot, some of the plots I showed, some of the, especially the linear ones, basically assumes that that's a linear disease progression that can occur. You know, basically it would be driven down to zero or driven up to, there's no cap. Oftentimes we're dealing with um, scales that are capped at some maximum or minimum value, uh, ADAS-COG, for example, HAMD, for example. Um, and in some cases, not necessarily these, but in some cases you're going to be um, unlikely to reach some of those extreme values. So treating these as continuous variables is problematic. Not only that, but if you treat them as a continuous variable, you could end up with a prediction that's going to give you a value outside of that 0 to 70 or 0 to 52 just by the shape of the model and how you've described it. You could overshoot it or something like that. And obviously that doesn't make any sense. I mean, it doesn't from a from a interpretation point of view, if you show predictions for a value that's outside of the scale of what's physiologically meaningful or relevant or what can occur, um, you're going to get pushback and questions from clinicians or, or um, experts in the field. So one approach to dealing with this, um, or I should say an approach to dealing with this, is to perform the modeling on a transformed scale. So in this case, we might, um, one of the examples that we have, you can take a look out on opendiseasemodels.org, is an ADAS-COG example where we used a logit transform. In this case, we would, would use a logit transform to allow us to, to operate on, uh, to, to model a continuous variable and then back transform for things like model diagnostics, interpreting simulations, and then this, this allows you then to, to actually do your modeling on a, on a continuous scale and you're not kind of going to run into a problem. Well, you still run into a problem, but at least you have a way of dealing with, um, you can then limit just by the nature of that scale uh, predictions at a certain value. So you can make sure that when you get predictions back, they won't be above 70 or they won't be below zero in some cases, depending upon what it is you're modeling. Okay, so the question was, what's the difference in, in capped scales uh, with an asymptote versus um, something that reaches a plateau? And actually, I, probably these are, the, you know, these, these, the scale itself is, um, is going to be what drives whether or not you transform it. And in the case of, you know, if, if, if disease progression is something that isn't going to continue on ad infinitum, so to speak, and you are going to be maxed out at some value, you can consider transforming it um, and, and doing, the, doing the modeling on that transformed scale. And then apply, you can still apply some of these, the models that are, um, that you have to that transformed data. It's just a matter of um, then back transforming to make your prediction. Okay, so um, that's kind of the, 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 background on some of the models that we might have used. Again, um, there's, there's a myriad of other ones that you could, you, we, we can't possibly cover all the different possibilities of, of disease progression models that you might use. Um, but given that, given those models, given the data we collected, where can we start to make some improvements? How can we improve um, disease progression models? Well, we can think about really improving them in four different areas. Uh, again, you could think about improving the data. Um, you could get data that's, and somebody brought this point up, we want to get as long-term data as we possibly can. We want to get as the data that, that goes out as long as, as, as much as reasonably possible. Um, we want to delineate or be able to dissociate placebo or intervention responses from degrees, disease progression. So things that will occur naturally as the course of disease versus um, issues that will occur via intervention. When it comes to endpoints, you want to think about using uh, multiple markers of a disease process. And I think the, uh, the, the slide that Matt presented on the calcium model is a very good example of this. But um, you, might, you might intertwine or, or bring together um, early biomarkers as well as to help predict some of the clinical outcome. Um, you might build models really that span multiple indications. Uh, in some cases that's not as simple as others, but you could envision uh, where you have um, therapeutics 
or, or changes in disease processes that may benefit, you know, the immune system comes to mind, where you might work changes in the immune system, whether it be ramping it up or, or, or knocking it down, um, have multiple uses across indications. So kind of pulling that data together where you can to learn information. Um, and then really the simultaneous description then um, of multiple therapeutic interventions. And then we talk about the models themselves, and I guess we can't really stress enough that obviously early on, models are gonna be empirical and relatively simplistic, especially in, in new disease areas you don't have a lot of information on. But as you, as you get along further, the idea is to, to augment those with additional data from that you've collected, augment it with additional natural history data in the disease, and, and, and build portions of the model to account for both population variability as well as uncertainty. And so with that in mind, one of the things that, that, we, that you'd have to keep in the back of your mind is how you bring in um, prior information or how you would deal with parts of the model that, that may not be addressed um, directly by the data. Um, invariably, there's going to be portions of the model that, that you're not going to be able to um, estimate given the data that you have. Uh, in that case, you can think about, well, what, what some options that we could do? Well, we could, we could fix the model. We could, we could fix, the, uh, fix those parameters of the model um, to some reliable values. That in and of itself is going to, I mean, there's, you're then kind of left with, you know, kind of similar effects across everybody. Or probably a better approach might be to use some type of Bayesian um, implementation where you bring in those parameters and then you put some uncertainty around it. Um, that, uh, that, un that amount of uncertainty and how you bring that uncertainty in would depend upon how much you know. Maybe that's just simply something, maybe it's based upon um, pulling together a number of uh, data from the literature to drive that uncertainty. Maybe it's based upon talking to disease specialists to drive portions of the model. But you need to think about how you might bring those portions, how you might deal with those, uh, that, that aspect of the modeling as you're, as you're moving forward. So when we talk about these challenges, I guess, so to speak, what are some of the possible solutions? What, how might we deal with these challenges? Well, with respect to data, um, you can start to develop disease progression models early on and, and hopefully use biomarkers to predict um, early signs of disease progression to um, help define what's going to occur later on. Um, you know, the next bullet is begin long-term disease progression or safety trials post-approval. Obviously, that's a big cost versus benefit um, risk there, whether or not the, the, the uh, amount of money that's willing to be spent is, is worth doing it. Um, oftentimes, what we're going to end up doing is pulling data across long-term trials, uh, hopefully within a company is already being done. I mean, ideally, that's that's already being done by everybody out there, that you, that you leverage data from either similar therapeutics uh, or from, you know, indications that have a similar, you know, underlying disease that you can use. And then across the industry, um, you know, there's some example of that with what the FDA does. I mean, they borrow, they borrow data between submissions. Obviously, that's not transparent, so that's not available. But there are, um, there are, implementations out there or there are people that are trying to, to trying to share data across the industry to help build, say, placebo models so that you can do a nice job of describing what's going on in placebo so you can have a good, good idea of describing what's going on with your, um, with your therapeutic. Um, you know, prospectively design long-term trials to study disease. The example here is the United Kingdom prospective diabetes study, um, really to kind of help assess short-term components that have that have that are long to give long-term signals of disease progression again how these get developed and who does it i mean it's really a cost benefit but but these are some of the things that kind of help with um, data issues that you might have um, so what about endpoints well when we talk about room for improvement as far as endpoints go um, you want to develop and apply biomarkers as early signals of disease progression. By that, what I mean is develop models for um, 
early biomarkers that you have so that by the time you, as you move forward in development, you can see how they, how those predict um, disease progression later on as you get more data. Um, obviously consider the relevance of the biomarker within the um, therapeutic intervention timeframe. And by that, what I mean is it speaks actually to what somebody raised earlier today, which is, you know, you only have a snapshot of data. You only collect data for, you know, six months, 12 months, 18 months, two or three years, and you have disease that go on long term. So you have to really be concerned about um, how well your biomarker is going to predict that disease progression overall. Um, obviously, mechanistic, the more mechanistic, mechanistic the better that you are. Um, and then linking, obviously, early, bi early markers. So these biomarkers you develop early on to outcomes later outcomes via modeling and then applying those either within that particular therapeutic or that the particular compound or across the therapeutic area. So how might we do that? Well, um, there are some examples out there uh, of, of borrowing, um, and I, I, meant, I just mentioned two, I just showed two kind of articles here. There's also um, larger, more uh, commercial developments, Entelos, the Archimedes model, where we have um, models to describe diseases and um, healthcare interventions in individuals and applying those across um, the therapeutic that you're interested in. And then finally, what, what about mechanistic models of disease? Well, these are just two examples of, of early HIV viral dynamics that uh, Perelson et al. put out that have been, you know, greatly uh, added to to some recent articles of hepatitis C. So in this case, you'll see uh, classic examples that were built upon um, viral dynamics or HIV that then were applied um, to um, in various incantations to hepatitis C um, to come up with models now. In this case, there's a most recent publication that actually describes um, or attempts to describe the ability of, of, of cure in hepatitis C treatment. And then there's a number of places where we have uh, sharing of either um, models, either biomodels, biomodels database. We have an opendiseasemodels.org that actually shares uh, Alzheimer's and uh, the calcium model. There's a recent article that talks about um, trying to get out there and, and set up standards for, for knowledge sharing. Obviously, that there's always a concern there of, of proprietary data, even, even insofar as data that you've collected for, for placebos. I mean, there's not always a, a desire to actually share those either. So ideally, the, the idea here is that the more they can share, obviously, you're not going to share um, commercial things that are going to give you some commercial advantage, but areas that, that um, through um, sharing between companies um, can help devise things like placebo models, um, even models for drug effect if they're general enough. Which leads us actually to the model that um, the model that actually Matt just brought up again. We're not going to go through this model, but I believe Matt mentioned this last week, and this is a good a good example of really a, a physiologically based model for simulation, um, where they searched the literature, they made some assumptions um, about what, what occurs with calcium and then applied that, applied four different therapeutic scenarios across really different indications to come up and see, you know, what's occurring and, and, and how is it, what's the long, what's the, what's the effect on um, the particular endpoint, whether it be, um, you know, laying down a bone, you know, osteo, osteoclast, osteogenesis, um, and so in this case, what we can actually do is you have a, a very large scale model, and this is a good example of one where um, if you only were to look at a piece of this and you said, oh, okay, well, I have just a small portion of this model, so what's going to happen if I give my drug? Well, I know what's occurring in this one part, but I really have no idea, you know, with, without seeing the whole picture, if you just sort of zoom in on part of this, you might make some... Uh, I wouldn't say poor decisions, but uninformed decisions about some aspect of, of the treatment and its effect on disease progression if you don't have the bigger picture. Now, you know, can we develop something like this for every therapeutic and 
all the time? Well, well, not necessarily, but it's just something to keep in the back of your mind that as you as you move forward and develop these um, disease progression models, the more mechanistic you can get, um, the better off you'll be. Yeah, and then I guess the other question, really, the other kind of overarching thing here is, is you know, what drives the what drives the generation of these disease progression models? I mean, um, your your the the areas that have lots of information and are also the areas that are being highly competitive and then the areas that are going to be least likely to be shared across companies and individuals. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, and, and the areas that you, you know, some of the other areas that aren't as highly competitive or there's not as much money to be made that the data is probably, the may, data may not be there to build some of the aspects of this model. But again, as you build these, you just have to do the best you can with the data that you have. And just keep in mind that um, what the limitations are. Um, okay, okay, so actually we covered um, the material relatively quickly today, quicker than I thought we may. Um, I'll be here if, if you have any questions. Let me just briefly talk about the uh, problem that we're gonna get today, that what I'll give you today. Basically, the, the, well, let me actually do this. Let me talk about some of the, we're not gonna cover these now, but just some of the things to think about as you as you look through the material and as you do the homework and, and before Friday is really, um, what are some of the questions or concerns you might have if you're handed a disease progression model when you have limited information about the underlying data? Um, an example of this might be what occurs with respect to what goes on at the FDA. I mean, you don't, you don't have a lot of information there about um, some of the models they develop. I mean, you, you know what they develop, but you don't have a lot of information. You can't see the underlying data oftentimes. Um, what are the desirable characteristics of, of PKPD study design when developing disease progression models? You know, do we want to have, uh, obviously you want to have multiple doses. Uh, do you need to have placebo groups? Can you can have natural history groups. Um, when is it necessary to separate placebo effects from disease progression? Or when can you do that? Um, and then we kind of talked a little bit about it, but think about it some more for Friday is really what approaches can we use to account for pieces of the model that are not supported by the data? And then what are the potential problems um, with a given approach. You know, and you know, some things to think about there might be, well, do we, do we use a simpler empirical model to describe the um, data? Do we, do we fix portions of the model we don't know anything about? Do we use, do we bring in prior information in the form of Bayesian priors and use a, a somewhat more complex sometimes um, analysis procedure. Okay, so for, the, for Friday's problem, I actually have a couple of questions here as well. Um, so you want, am I aware of any disease progression models in oncology field? Um, Off the top of my head, I don't, but that doesn't, I mean, that, that's, there very well could be some out there that I'm just not aware of. What I'll do, let me just take that back and, and put that question out to um, uh, some of my fellow colleagues here as well. I mean, I guess when you think about it, you could, you could very easily apply some of the um, models that look at uh, change in, um, change in, say, markers of, of anemia and things like that based upon drug treatment. I guess I'm trying to think about this for, for the oncology field. We're talking about natural history of, degree, of disease, so I guess oftentimes you're dealing with a defined treatment period where you give a medication, you give some kind of washout, and then I guess the, the drug grows back. I mean, I guess in theory you could describe, you know, the, the, the tumor growth that, that, that occurs over time or reoccurs within an individual or within a group of patients. Um, maybe a better example might be the oncology field where you have long-term treatment um, in some of the um, some of the leukemias where you where you just you know you're continually treating and you're and you're um, rather than necessarily curing or, or cutting something out or, or, or giving chemotherapeutic agents to actually kill the tumor. 
Um, let me let me put that out for Friday. Let me see what I can find as far as that goes. Yeah, you know what? I will. Uh, somebody asked a question about the um, reference on page uh, one sixty three. I will. Uh, I'll. I'll pull that reference. I'll pull those out for you. I, I will pull them for you. I'll, I'll verify what those actual journal articles are. I, I must argue that I must say I cut and pasted this, this, these particular references from another section. So it very well could be that I uh, either I, either they're not complete. I, I'll check that for you. <clears throat> okay. So with respect to the problem for, um, actually, I'll check all the any of the references I gave to see. Uh, um, really here. Somebody asked about, I think, page 161. I'll check the journals here to see what, um, I'll just make sure on the, on all the pages here what, what the references are. Okay, so for the problem, what, you're what you have, what you're going to be given now is data that were collected for 30 days during a phase two trial. Um, subjects were randomized to receive oral dosing for 20 days of either placebo or five different treatment groups. Um, and data were collected for the entire 30 days. And in this case, we have a, 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 um, a uh, disease progression model that, that we're going to be modeling. We're going to assume that this, we're going to be able to see this change in disease progression over 30 days. And, and you have some PK or some, some intervention that occurs over 20 days. Um, you also have a parallel group of individuals that received no treatment to provide information on natural disease history. I'll post the data set as soon as we're done. It's been compiled in a non-memory data set. It's already all complete. You don't have to do any kind of data merging. Um, and the type variable that will define each record. So you have dosing is type 0, PK is type 1. You have PD measurements. And then you also have um, PD measurement where there's uh, no treatment group. So we have, uh, you could think of it as um, drug treatment, placebo treatment, and we also have no treatment. Some hints about the models you might want to explore. Um, placebo model demonstrated a, a first order rise and fall with an overall maximum difference from the placebo group of about 10 to 30 um, percent. The PK follows a simple one compart model and the PD effect is not immediate so it lags behind the PK. It's not direct. So what I want you to do is explore the data, develop a model, PK, placebo, disease progression, drug effect to answer the following questions. Um, you might even be able to answer these without necessarily developing a model. Really, the goal here is just to look at the data and make some decisions. You know, what are the possible disease progression models you might use? Um, what are the possible drug effect models that you might use? Um, what could be used as a reasonable placebo model? In this case, how might you define the placebo portion of the data? And then finally, um, does the drug effect have an effect on the um, slope, the disease progression model, slope or intercept? Um, kind of maybe gave away the disease progression model, but maybe not actually, because <clears throat> um, that slope could really be affecting uh, one of the asymptotic portions as well, on you know, the, the time to disease progression or um, some other parameter, or the intercept. So can you, or can you even answer that question really? And so on Friday, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll kind of entertain answers to these study questions, as well as, uh, as well as, talk about the problem that, we, uh, that I've given you and see what you can get done. And as I said, I will, I will post um, in the next few minutes the uh, data set that's described here, as well as um, a revised, actually I'm gonna hold off on posting the revised PDF because I'll verify the, uh, all the references that are listed here in this um, PDF to make sure that they're all, they're all correct and you have all the information you need in case you wanna look up some of the articles or pull them. Okay, and then I, that's really it for today. So a bit shorter of a class than um, your, your uh, than what we typically have. And somebody did point out the fact that absolutely the, the page numbering is slightly different. Uh, just to make it ease of use for me to present, I put a few page breaks into some of the sections. I didn't add any material in what you all have already, but I will post uh, a copy of this PDF uh, once I just verify all the links and I um, should say verify all the uh, journal references that are in here to make sure they're correct. Um,
Yeah, I can, you know, uh, somebody asked what Entelos is doing, and I would, I would refer you to their website, honestly. I mean, uh, they are developing, they are, I should say, they've developed models of therapeutic interventions and healthcare interventions and um, physiologic models that can be applied to um, given areas of therapeutics. I, I honestly don't know offhand um, what particular therapeutics they're involved in. Um, I would guess that a quick Google on Entelos or, or Google on Archimedes model will, will get you to where you need to be. Um, I, would, I would defer you to there because there, I, I'm not going to be able to tell you as much about it. I don't have uh, firsthand knowledge of, of, what, of what that is. Okay, so I'll stick around for another five or 10 minutes for any questions. Otherwise, uh, after that, we'll sign off. And so thanks everybody for um, coming today and, and being attentive during the uh, lecture. And uh, I will, like I said, I'll be here for about five or 10 minutes and then uh, I'll see, otherwise I'll see you all on Friday. Or I should say, you'll hear me on Friday. Thanks. Yeah, somebody asked about the zero asymptote model. And I, yeah, I'll double check that plot. I'll make sure, I'll double check that the, uh, it's actually, um, showing what it is we want to show where the data that went into generating that plot was doing what it's supposed to be doing. I'll, I'll check that for Friday's class and we'll, we'll touch base on it again just to make sure that uh, it's consistent with what um, is known about that model. Uh, yeah, you know, question here is um, the idea of pulling together studies for the development of a disease progression model and I think um, one of the one of my experiences that I had in the not too distant past, or not too distant past, really was an issue with pulling studies together. And what we ended up with uh, was a one of the studies ended up having a a fairly different placebo response um, in the development of that disease progression model. So we had to kind of, I guess, say deal with it. I mean, we we allowed it to be different in that particular. Um, group. I think the, 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 the difficulty we had in that case um, for the model that we ended up developing was simply that we didn't have a, we, we ended up not having, say, a natural treatment group. Um, and it just so happened this particular therapeutic, um, there wasn't a lot of information on this particular endpoint. So there wasn't um, a natural history really on it. So we, we really could only model placebo and um, drug response data. So we, we didn't have a good feel for what was occurring in the underlying, at least in the underlying disease state, given the, given the endpoint that we were looking at. We knew what was going on in the underlying disease state, but not for that particular endpoint. Um, so interstudy differences there were, were assessed via differences in um, the slope of the drug effect or the, 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 the onset of the drug effect really for the, for the, I'm sorry, for the placebo response. And we allowed those to differ across the studies. We also allowed um, the parameters for the actual drug effect though were similar. So we didn't actually have to deal with them and they were, they were similar across the studies. It was just the placebo really treatment group that was different. So we had some issues there. I think though, um, the point here though is that you, you need to be concerned about it. You need to think about it when you're pooling data and you need, if, you, if you have unusual responses in, in some of the data, doesn't mean you can throw it out, but you need to try and account for it. Um, in our case, we had something that was unusual that uh, we really couldn't explain away. It was difficult to explain away other than the fact that, you know, the other compound of this was this was one study was done in Europe and one study was done in the US. So that, that compounded it even, even more that um, there was some reason to believe that there were differences in uh, placebo groups in these, and there shouldn't really have been. Um, so it was, it was kind of a struggle to kind of uh, explain that, not explain it away, but kind of explain it in terms um, to get clinicians really to buy in on it. I mean, to, especially people who weren't necessarily um, sold on the idea of modeling it. And you oftentimes are left with um, reconciling the model you developed in results versus what the statisticians might have uh, done in their results.
and then you're oftentimes left with uh, playing one off the other and, and coming up with a rationale as to why. It depends upon when you implement these things too. I should say uh, <clears throat> that when you implement the disease progression models and, and, and how you implement them also comes into play here. Uh, I think if you do everything at the end, um, the, the value of these kinds of models is um, questionable really um, and, and the utility of them. I think you wanna try and develop these early on um, in the process of, of drug development so that you can then apply them um, throughout the process and get buy-in on that model. I mean, and get, get buy-in from clinicians and everybody else on that model that it, it makes sense and then what you're, what you're doing is, has validity. Okay, I think, uh, I think then what we'll do is we'll, we'll end it there today. Thanks everybody for uh, coming to the class. Um, any other questions that come up between now and Friday with the data set, just hold on to them and we'll talk about them on Friday and Friday's class will mainly be um, just to kind of talk about this problem that I gave as well as working through some of the study questions or your thoughts about the study questions. So again, thanks everybody.